So this is the overview of the webinar. Uh, this is how we're going to go about it. So I'll slowly go through um, the context of the COVID-19 pandemic in Zambia. So the COVID uh, started in uh, 18 March 2020. It came from uh, some visitors from, uh, from Europe. Uh, at first, we saw quite a strong technocratic response with the Minister of Health uh, in the forefront. It was accompanied by legislation which set out the measures aimed at controlling the spread of COVID-19. So the controls at the airports, um, the social distancing, all those kind of measures. Uh, we were quite influenced by the images we were getting from Europe. So there was, you know, kind of uncertainty and panic at the beginning. Uh, but I think it, it then kind of settled. The distribution at that from the, in the first few months is, is more like, like this. It's along the line of rail in Zambia, uh, which also happens to be the, the kind of areas that we are surveyed by telephone survey, mostly north, eastern uh, Zambia and uh, Lusaka area. Of course, it has spread much more widely. I don't have a recent map, uh, but at currently the cases tend at, the official cases tend at 16,661. And it seems to have slowed down since uh, July, August. Uh, but there's also a suggestion, and maybe a Ginian uh, and Mutsunda can comment on that, because I think they know more about the study, that there was also a serological survey which suggests that actually quite a, a good number of Zambians had, been, uh, had contracted COVID-19, and they don't appear in the numbers. So that's something research is really going on to see what's happening uh, there. But overall, the death rate has been uh, quite low. So Zambia's response to COVID is limited by economic and uh, structural constraints. Um, so it's really a perfect storm. We were already in quite difficulties, economically speaking. Uh, we have financial challenges, like a ne negative economic growth and then unsustainable debt. In fact, we're entering a default at the moment. Um, you know, then also we have some limited state capacity in dealing with uh, healthcare, which also has undermined the response. We do get a lot of support uh, in the, from the donors in the health sector as well. And of course, you know, in, the, in the current financial situation, the funds for social sectors were squeezed by high, high debt servicing cost and the public wage bill. So these are the circumstances we find ourselves in. So I'm sure the, the you know, the the, quite the surveys and field work are, are also informed by those circumstances. If you want to read more on the, on COVID-19, more like the political economy of COVID, there are three blogs uh, that we wrote, and you can find them on this uh, on this site or on the Cypher website as well. So this is where I want to leave. The context, and then I want to hand over to um, Ellen to share uh, her findings from the survey. Are we good? Okay, perfect. Um, thank you, Maria, and and thank you, Masanda and Ginny, as well for for joining us with with the sort of the discussion of this today. Um, what I want to present are um, results of, from the first GLD Cipher survey that we did in Zambia between July 2nd and August 13th. So it's a, it's a while ago and was kind of more towards the beginning of the, of the spread of COVID, but definitely if you look at the numbers, there was certainly, it was, it was um, a, a, an issue already at that time. We have about 2000 respondents. Um, we've produced seven reports that you can find on the website. Um, and then this is the second webinar. It was implemented in, in um, so basically cooperation or implemented with Ubuntu research as well and FISO and Misendia. So the main issues that are covered in, this, in the full survey are fears, vulnerabilities, trust in authorities, precautionary behaviors, economic repercussions, response to illness, and then community restrictions. Um, and we've produced, like I said, brief reports on each of those. Today, what I want to focus on are the results from the, the sections that look at fears, precautionary behaviors, response to illness, and then community restrictions. So those are going to be the main sections that we look at today. 
Starting out with the, looking just at the fears at the time, again, of the survey, um, we found that even then most people feared the infection. About two out of every three people ref uh, were concerned that they would be um, become effect infected, right? Worried or very worried. Um, those who were older, above 55 years old, were actually less worried than the young about becoming infected. Um, interesting to think about reasons why that might be the case. Those with higher education were more worried about it than those with lower ed education. And, and of course, um, people we found generally knew how COVID-19 was being transmitted. So it wasn't just about um, sort of a knowledge issue, but those who knew more were also more worried. Um, so that gives us a map also of looking at the, the extent to which people in different parts of the country that we were surveying uh, feared infection. We found though that the fears go far beyond health concerns. And of course that's been a discussion in, in those looking at sort of the effect of COVID in Sub-Saharan Africa. So it's not surprising or necessarily unique to Zambia um, that we saw wide, widespread fear of hunger, uh, loss of income and increased crime. Um, so about you know more than 70%, for example, uh, were fearing that they would sort of go hungry because of COVID about another 50 or 60% were fearing an, an income reduction um, and more than 60 or 70% were, were fearing the increased crime or violence. Um, the feeling with regards to crime and violence, 31% feared an increase of crime and about 65% of those who had, had these fears feared both crime and violence. Um, we found that also Zambians who were above the age of 55 were less likely than younger people to fear going hungry or to experience crime or violence. Remember, they were also the ones less worried about becoming infected. Um, put so, sort of more simply, they seemed to be just more chill about this um, than others did at the time. Uh, Zambians with higher education were also less likely to fear going hungry, but more likely to fear income reduction. Um, and in fact, we discussed this in the last webinar, which you can find online, but um, they also were more likely to actually experience uh, an income reduction or reduction in hours. We find that the, there's a big a sort of widespread worry about social stigma, right? So people thinking that other, others would feel think poorly of them if they had COVID-19. About 60% of Zambians felt this way at the time of our survey. Of course, that's problematic in the sense that it often means that people are unwilling to say that they have COVID if they, if they have. Um, so that's one concern with it. Another concern that's sort of more, more widespread has also been the concern that when people have COVID or, or the concern that, that these kinds of diseases um, can exacerbate what we think of as insider and outsider sort of bias or, or sort of uh, stereotypes and stigmas against outsiders. Um, so we had done the, an experiment that we did both in Malawi and in Zambia, where we presented individuals with sort of a hypothetical neighbor who has either had, you know, a, a headache or coughing or, or a, a, a hurt leg. Um, and then we, we asked, you know, would you be willing to take this person? And who was either, um, in the Zambian case, was either Zambian, Tanzanian or Malawian. Um, in the Malawian cases, either Malawian, Mwenye, or, or Tanzanian. And we asked them, I'm sorry, Zambian, and we asked them if they would be willing to take the neighbor to the hospital, if they thought that the neighbor had COVID, and if they thought that the neighbor should be allowed to move freely about the community. Um, so what we find in Zambia, I think is interesting, and I would love to talk about this in the, in the plenary, but basically is that, you know, Zambians were less willing to help Tanzanians if they needed assistance getting to the hospital. Um, but, and they, and they were sort of less willing to help those who had COVID than, than those with other problems, but they weren't more likely to help or to think that either the Tanzanians had COVID, right? So they didn't necessarily associate the outsider status with an expectation that they, that they had COVID itself. Um, so it's something again, worth thinking about what was, uh, you know, kind of what that means. And they were also then more likely to think that anybody who had COVID should be staying home. So there was a, a widespread sense that uh, people who, who had these symptoms, whether they were Zambian, Tanzanian or, or uh, Malawian should actually be staying home. Um, when we look at what people were doing to sort of yeah, take precautionary behavior. In some ways, the fears that we just discussed may be actually promoting precautionary actions. We certainly found that those who were very worried about the COVID infection were more likely to take precautionary measures than those who were less worried. 
right? So at least it draws into question the sense that at least some sense of um, of concern, some sense that the the that the sort of COVID is widespread may actually help people um, to take it more seriously and to take precautions. Um, we found that most Zambians were at least taking some precautions. So more than 90% were more likely to be, have more likely washing hands. 85% said they were less likely to visit family and friends. Again, re recalling that this was in the period where people were very concerned and, and knew about COVID um, and yet not maybe as tired about these kinds of behaviors. 81% were less likely to attend funerals. 77% were less likely to attend religious services and a little more than half were less likely to go to work outside of their home, right? So again, we found that this sense of taking precautions was, was pretty widespread and, and more likely among those who were worrying more. Um, we also found, and maybe not surprisingly, that people people felt it was particularly hard to avoid group gatherings. Um, but I think what was also interesting and important was that we found in the northern and Machunka provinces that they were the most likely to have the sort of or had the greatest shares of respondents who thought it was difficult to stay home except for essentials and to not gather in groups. Right. So again, if you look at these maps, it's in the darker areas where people are. Um, where people are uh, essentially sort of finding it harder to gather in groups or in the darker green where they're hard, finding it harder to stay home. We've also asked whether or not within communities there were restrictions that were taking place. So not just whether or not individuals in their households chose to, to sort of implement restrictions, but also whether or not um, the, within their community they were uh, either sort of not going out, not gathering in groups or having curfews. And we found that about 22% of those who said that their community had at least had had sort of um, restrictions on going out and mark, I'm sorry, closing marketplaces, not, not going out, closing marketplaces. 23% had curfews and 36% had instituted restrictions about gathering in groups. Um, and while we found that only, like I said, about half of the, of the respondents said that they had these types of restrictions, when we had community restrictions, we found that they were generally enforced about three quarters of the time, actually a bit more, um, that we found that the curfew was, was enforced and that gatherings were also in, enforced um, basically about 70% of the time. So there was a sense in which um, community restrictions are also followed. When we look at just sort of the ways in which people themselves were responding to the illnesses, um, we find that at that time, most Zambians were reporting no symptoms. Again, recalling that this is the July to August period. 90% uh, of the sample said that they had reported no, none of the symptoms. We asked if they had coughs, uh, dry cough, shortness of breath or fever in the past two weeks. And then we had asked them what they had done in response to that. Um, 65% of those who had had symptoms had visited clinics. I mean, we'd also found at that time that the symptoms were somewhat more prevalent in the central districts than in places like Northern Machinga. Again, remember, keep in mind that what, when we talk about those with symptoms, we're talking about a fairly small sample. So we only had about 198 um, out of the 2000 reporting that they'd had symptoms in the last two weeks. We find that people are sort of um, report willingness to get tested if they are sick, but doubt that other people will get tested. So it's an interesting finding that draws into question um, both uh, sort of the question of whether or not people feel uh, free and confident saying that they wouldn't get tested or if they simply have a sort of a less, a less high expectations of others than themselves. But it was 92% of Zambians saying they would get tested if they had symptoms and the test was given for free. Um, but again, only about 50% said that they thought that other people would get tested under the same conditions. So something to think about with regards to what, um, what, why that makes sense. Um, we also found some interesting sort of findings with regards to how people who had symptoms still engaged, right? So um, what we found actually was that those who had symptoms, that, the 198 who said they had symptoms, were actually less likely to take the measures against spreading illness compared to those um, who we asked, okay, if you had symptoms, what would you do? So 40% of those who had said that they had symptoms said they still, still engaged with family and friends. About 23% said they still visited public spaces. 
And that compared to 18% of those who weren't sick, but were asked what they would do if they had symptoms. And they said they would still engage with family and friends and 13% said that they would visit public places. Um, Central province was where we had the highest share of people with the self-reported symptoms, but the lowest share of people who said that they would avoid family and friends. I think that raises some interesting questions. The first is whether or not it's that people simply imagine it's easier to distance themselves from their family and friends and others when they're sick than it actually is, right? Or another reading of these results is that it is those who are less likely to distance themselves to begin with who are then more likely to become sick. Um, and unfortunately, our, our research doesn't allow us to disentangle those two, those two readings of the, of the data. Um, I want to end on a sort of happy note, if you will, and that is in the sense that most, most Ambians have at least one person to help them if they're sick. Um, most of these are family, right? 70% of people felt that they could rely on their family if they were sick. About 30% felt that they could rely on their neighbors. 42% on their religious leaders, 22% on their village heads. So those were the places where we found the most ability to rely on, on other sources or the sort of most likely sources. Um, unfortunately, one in four Zambians um, felt that they couldn't count on any of these sources of help if they, if they were sick. So I guess I'm not ending on quite an up note, but um, again, at least sort of there's a fairly widespread safety net um, for most Zambians. Um, so again, I just, I'm hoping that this will spark a discussion and we look really forward to your input in terms of how you see these results and, and, and read them. And again, a, a final thank you to Ubuntu and Saipar for, for collaboration on this, as well as the collaborators of the team, which is Cecilia, Bonnie, Karen, Adam, Maria, Kristen, and Erica. Um, and then finally to our funders, um, we've been very fortunate that the Swedish Research Council and FORMAS had both um, given us quite significant funds that allowed us to be able to take a, take advantage of, on the one hand, the sort of telephone numbers we'd gathered from a 2019 survey, and then the um, sort of the partnerships that we were able to form to to be able to sort of see what see what was what we can tell you about the COVID on the ground and then help to make sense of it. So thank you. Thanks, Ellen. Um, perhaps you can, okay, I guess we can mention it on the next steps, but there's another round of uh, survey coming as well. Uh, so that's why these kind of meetings are very important to see if sometimes we can sharpen some of our questions and uh, get more fruitful findings as well. Um, with that, are there any questions from people? If you want to ask a question, can you please use the chat function? to ask a, a question at this stage. We'll have some more discussion at the end of the sessions, but if you have any immediate questions, please let us know. Okay, there's one question from uh, Johanneke, who uh, does research on religion, so hence her, her question. She says, did you find any more about the response of religions to COVID? We didn't actually. I mean, we had found earlier that um, that people were no more likely to, to listen to their religious leaders with regards to whether or not they should have, they should sort of avoid large gatherings. That was something that we presented in the last discussion and, um, and that I think is interesting. And that's not about different religions and how that might matter. For example, thinking about, you know, Pentecostals or Catholics, et cetera. Um, but what we had thought it, at least initially was that there was some possibility that, um, that religious leaders would have more, kind of legitimacy or be able to get people to sort of not have large gatherings, given that part of those are, you know, kind of um, church services and other types of gatherings. And we didn't find that to be the case. Yeah, I think it's something that will probably, that might come out in the next two presentations. Uh, having read their reports, it'll be interesting uh, to have a further discussion about it. Yeah. I think for now, that's all the questions that we have. Maybe we can ask Musonda to um, give his presentation. Yeah, so Gina and I are going to give this presentation uh, on behalf of the social science and uh, community engagement uh, team here at uh, Zambat. Um, just to say that uh, we are currently uh, conducting a study called Treats. Um, just a minute. We're currently conducting a study called Retreats. 
uh, which is assessing the impact of HIV prevention on TB in uh, 12 uh, Zambian uh, communities, which are formerly Popat uh, communities. And we saw this, and, and this community, yeah, I, I, and we saw this opportunity actually to um, really, you know, uh, conduct a study, you know, uh, on uh, the interaction between uh, uh, COVID and TB. So we sought uh, funding from ABCDP, who are the funders of TREATS, uh, to conduct the study uh, in Gungu Wacha. And this study is running from July 2020 to October 2021 evaluating, you know, COVID-19 symptoms, you no know, case, cases and exposure, and how people are experiencing and responding to uh, COVID-19. Uh, today, uh, Gina and I are going to present, you know, on the two components of the study, which is uh, which are community engagement and the broad survey, uh, qualitative research. Um, and community engagement was really aimed, you know, at uh, helping community to prepare uh, a, a community emergency plan, as well as respond, you know, to uh, epidemics, um, as well as, you know, to ensure that uh, uh, we respond to issues that are coming out of the community during implementation. While the broad brush survey uh, was meant to rapidly assess the you know, awareness, responses, and impact of COVID-19. Again, to uh, inform community engagement strategies, as well as the uh, implementation of the study overall. So I'm going to present really on the vision and, the, uh, and process of community engagement, and then Jenny will present on the BBS. Um, I must say from the onset that uh, the grant uh, that we are presenting on was really mostly focused on epidemiology and you know, lab science and community engagement is really the scene really to try and uh, help, you know, uh, 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 AP and the uh, lab science, but also the social science also is meant to help and inform community engagement activities, as well as the uh, implementation uh, process, particularly you know, to help you know, with the coming up with you know, community messages, you know, and also helping the community to develop their images, uh, uh, epidemic uh, preparedness uh, plan. So specifically, the, ob the specific objectives uh, are to uh, to establish, you know, a, uh, a dialogue process with the community with interest uh, groups, and this is an ongoing, actually, dialogue and ongoing uh, uh, process. But also to conduct, you know, immediate and rapid formative qualitative research, so as to understand, you know, the local, social, and physical factors. So, for example, how does location, you know, housing, uh, transport routes and networks influence the way uh, that people are experiencing and are responding to uh, COVID-19. But also to, you know, to adapt existing uh, material that is available, uh, including IC materials, um, to inform, you know, uh, messaging and also supporting the implementation process, including the public health, me health measures that have been conducted uh, in this uh, community. Uh, but more importantly, also to document, you know, how the people are responding to, to the study, uh, to the COVID uh, public health measures, including issues of, you know, uh, 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 that are ethical in nature. And we have a, a PhD student, you know, uh, looking at the disability. But also more generally looking at you know the impact of COVID uh, on economic, social, as well as the stigma uh, issues. Just a minute, uh, I, I I need to tell someone that I'm gonna go.
sorry for that. Um, so from the onset, like I said, we initiated a dialogue process with the, uh, the community. And uh, even before we uh, developed the grant, we, 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 we started talking to community members. More importantly, you know, to ensure that uh, we get their voices, you know, that the ideas are included uh, in the process. Um, we instituted a dialogue, you know, uh, with different uh, uh, community uh, stakeholder groups as well as district stakeholder groups. This included the response team, uh, the adolescent and adult community advisory boards, as well as other opinion uh, uh, leaders. We also documented, you know, conversations with uh, different uh, uh, groups. Uh, but mainly using you know, the mobile app uh, phone technology uh, because of the uh, uh, situation at, at the time. Uh, so it was really a, a good a, a experience to use this technology, you know, when we're used to really having face-to-face, -face, you know, uh, uh, group discussions, you know, or, or, or interviews. And mainly to try and, you know, uh, gain you know, uh, first hand, you know, uh, understanding uh, of how the people, you know, uh, were experiencing COVID-19 for the first time and how, like, how it was affecting actually uh, their lives, including the rumors and the inform misinformation that was coming out from there, but also looking at what needs they had, including if, uh, uh, information uh, needs. Uh, during that time, we also requested, you know, CAPS to collect uh, popular knowledge and opinions about COVID-19, basically what people were saying about COVID-19, you know, and uh, how they were actually experiencing it. So this was really before uh, developing the grant. Then just before we uh, got clearance uh, from the ethics committee, we again continued uh, uh, dialoguing with uh, the, the community uh, groups. And in particular, we created what we call the, uh, or what we are calling the COVID-19 community team. Um, and this was established you know, uh, in a collaborative uh, manner with uh, our community partners, including the community advisory boards, the all center committees, uh, as well as the uh, district uh, officials. And they, and, and this uh, team is composed of, you know, the CAB, some district health, you know, uh, and, and health facility representatives, and also opinion leaders in the community, including people from the church, from schools, a traditional healer, and so on and uh, so forth. Uh, to formalize this group, we also developed uh, um, um, in terms of uh, reference to ensure also that there was really wide uh, uh, representation uh, on the team. And, and so uh, some of the um, uh, uh, roles of, uh, of this team is to provide oversight as well as, you know, help us, you know, to uh, disseminate uh, uh, study information in the community and also get, you know, uh, buy-in but more importantly, continue building, you know, uh, uh, the trust. And I must say that we've been working with uh, this particular community for about 16 years. So we do have, you know, uh, a good uh, working relationship with the, uh, the community, but also wanted, you know, to uh, identify uh, any information gaps that uh, 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 maybe you know, uh, 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 they are in the community, so that we would actually, you know, uh, inform the development of the of, of, of the grant. But more importantly, you know, the community engagement, you know, and the other processes uh, on the on the ground, and also uh, one of the roles is basically for this group to support, you know, the development of uh, uh, key messages and also engagement uh, strategies. So basically they've been very you know, good at uh, helping us um, uh, uh, develop you know, the, the, the key messages that we are using uh, currently in the, in the brochures and, and, and the flyers. And like I said before, 
a key output for this group will be really developing a community emergency preparedness plan. And this will be really, um, I would say, a bottom-up plan of how, you know, uh, uh, the Ngungu water community can deal with the emergencies, not only COVID-19, but in other emergencies, but using this uh, experience. We know that they've experienced things like, uh, you know, cholera before and the, uh, and the other diseases. So this is just uh, um, a, a picture of uh, a meeting with some of the uh, CCD members, and you can see Junior uh, in the middle there. So um, we have actually continued that to to dialogue with uh, uh, the. These, these community groups, including the CCT, uh, uh, after uh, getting ethical approval. By and large, they've helped us to review that material, uh, including IC materials, and they continue to give us you know, uh, feedback from the community. So from time to time, we meet them and we ask them about uh, if there are any you know, changes, new experiences uh, from uh, the community. They've also supported, you know, the broad brush survey, which is the qualitative uh, a piece of research that Jenny is going uh, to, to present on. And more importantly, they were key, you know, in uh, helping us interpret the findings, you know, and do uh, uh, member checking, basically, you know, uh, uh, improving, you know, on the findings and, and, and also giving us, you know, some nuances to some of the findings that we you know, we 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 actually uh, got from the community, um, and also they have helped us to you know to translate these findings in, in, into practice by actually you know informing the community engagement you know um, uh, strategies. So that has been uh, quite uh, good. So some of the um, meetings we've had with the uh, the uh, community groups have included the CAB, you know the the. COVID community team itself, meetings with you know, other groups such as the church, the schools, the health facility staff, and also our door to door sensitization, um, educating the community about COVID 19, but more importantly, talking about uh, the, 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 uh, the study that we're going to be implementing soon, and also views uh, announcements. Um, as a way of actually informing the community uh, using uh, loud hearers. So we also had the uh, challenges that we've uh, uh, experienced. Um, so we've been uh, working for this community, like I said, for almost for over 16 years, I would say for a long time. And to some extent, there's you no know, that danger you know, of pushing you know, uh, your ideas you know, onto the community. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why we decided to, you know, to to have a, a, a to create a, a community COVID COVID team, uh, uh, which has you know broad membership. I like working with just the CAB that we've been working with for a long time, as well as you know the health center uh, committee, and also to some extent, you know, community engagement and social science uh, are really the face, you know, of of this of the studies that we we conduct and and some extent we feel pressures you know to do more you know as 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 a unit you know we feel more accountable more than other you know parts you know of 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 the of, of the study and, and sometimes you know you may get you know blood you know lines between you know advocacy and and research and some extent this this has really showed up in in, in in, in this study, you know, uh, where you know you you feel like you're trying to educate the community, but meanwhile, Euro is trying not to actually you know do research and 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 and, and get you know uh, views about uh, uh, the community. As most of you know, that uh, we Zambians, you know, uh, uh, like greeting. You know, before you know we do anything, you know, when we go into homes, sometimes we. You, when you reach a, a house, you're given a, a you know a, a stool to sit and all that. But during COVID nineteen, you know, there's been that loss of you no know, cultural 
touch, you know, we, we, and, and some of our committee mobilizers complain, for example, that when there's no handshake, it feels like, you know, having gotten, you know, that, you know, uh, permission, you know, to, to talk to, 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 you know, to, to the individuals. And if you're not invited in the house, for example, it feels like, well, you, you're not so much welcome. But I think these are some of the things we, we, we need to start, you know, um, appreciating and, and learning that the, the context is actually uh, 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 different, yeah. So also some of our committee mobilizers have found it a, a bit difficult because they're not having those good face-to-face, -face, you know, conversations, especially that, you know, one have to mask and one has to social distance at the, term, at the same time, you know, talking to, you know, uh, a, a, a participant. Um, so these are some of the things actually we have actually, you know, uh, uh, experience, you know, and um, even our, our community mobilizers, when, when they go into the community, some of them, you know, depending on the activity that they're doing, they feel maybe less uh, uh, connected because of fear of, you know, infection. And, and, and we have one or two incidents where someone ends, you know, um, uh, on observation quickly facing the church service just for fear of not getting infected because you can see that, you know, a number of people or a person close to you is, is actually not, you know, uh, wearing a mask and so on and uh, so forth. So looking ahead, uh, I think that we've learned a lot from uh, uh, COVID-19 um, and uh, we, we think this will actually inform the way we do a research uh, going forward. Uh, more importantly, it may be really prudent to really have a mix of both the new and old ways you know, of collecting data. And that's something that we really suggest need to learn, but also that's something that the community um, members themselves need to, to, to appreciate you know, and, 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 and trust you know, that the researchers um, mean well. Um, we can also think uh, learn from other disciplines, for example, the biomedical you know, uh, uh, colleagues, in the, in the sense that uh, when we look at you know uh, self screening or self sampling, what has happened there is really you know giving you know uh, 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 power and authority to individuals to let's say to collect their own samples, where you know uh, previously it would be you know um, a professional doing that, and and I think that we can move in that regard as well, uh, given the lessons from COVID nineteen that maybe. You know, some individuals can actually uh, be trained, you know, as community-based ethnographic perspective researchers to try and really collect, you know, uh, information or, or data on our behalf, qualitative data on our behalf that you will still feel is you know, uh, of, of, of good quality. So these are some of the, uh, I think, lessons that uh, uh, we, we need to really uh, take forward. Yeah. Thank you. I think I'll, I'll stop here and the next presentation is by, by, by Jenny. And so what I've done is really just presented the process of our, our community uh, engagement. And uh, Jenny will present on the findings of the, BB, of the BBS, but also including you know, some of the you know, issues we learned from community engagement because they are more of qualitative nature. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Musonda. That's I think it's important to talk about methodology uh, uh, as well, you know, in, in this new environment that we're in, how do you do field work under these circumstances? And like you said, you know, the, the activist part of it, uh, I think it's something we can come back to during the, the panel. Um, can everyone see my slide? Yep, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Thanks, Ms. Sonda. So um, broad brush survey is a rapid qualitative assessment approach that we've used um, quite widely in sub-Saharan Africa and it's also been used in Europe. Um, the idea is that you do a sort of very broad sweep of social organizations, social networks, uh, physical features and community narratives of a place and that you can address it to a question we found that it is a very effective way of uh, communicating with other disciplines, of getting social science into these epidemiological <laughs> surveys um, and uh, of sort of making communities count. So this is something that we've done quite often. 
So for Ngungu Bwacha is are there actually is actually two communities lying next to each other in Kabwe. Um, in total, the population is 28,000. Um, it's an urban community, but sort of lying, lying towards the outskirts of Kabwe. So it has a bit of rural sort of edges. Um, so for the BBS, we um, broad brush survey, we did five days field work. The field work was carried out by two social scientists um, accompanied by, by local field workers sometimes. Um, so it actually kicks off with a focus group discussion with a sort of community leadership group, mainly the health centre committee, but also other um, representative groups. And then it moves into a spiral walk and the walk in this case followed where the community identified as COVID hotspots. Um, and then we did observations in the community at the hotspots. And then we did more structured observations in these different places, which included the list underneath here. Um, obviously mainly gathering places, and um, but, but sometimes certain housing structures that people felt would be more vulnerable um, in the context of COVID, for example, semi-detached houses. And we did the observations at different times, um, mainly in the day, but we also did a night observation. We did it mainly in the weekdays, but also some at the weekend, so that we did observations in churches, for example, at the weekend. And then we had two focus group discussions, one with women and one with men. So very rapid um, piece. So just to say that kind of conducting research and training in COVID is obviously different. And we have, Zambot has PPE guidelines that we adhered to, which meant that we had to provide participants with masks and, um, and space and make sure we were in a nice sort of airy um, place. And when we did our observations, uh, the social scientists were careful like not to go right into a bar or into a video shop uh, or spend too long there. So uh, the key findings I want to present um, before I talk about stigma is um, about awareness, response and impact of COVID. So firstly, in response to awareness, this really backs up some of what Ellen found in their survey the community members were extremely well informed about COVID to the point that they were a bit fed up with it, actually. They were sort of, given the sort of invisibility of the disease in their lives, they were sort of a bit inundated with information. They definitely knew what they should do and should not do. Um, but they also did make sense of COVID very much based on their experience with HIV. And that's because that was another epidemic that had a huge impact on their life um, and that they've learned to live with and had a really profound impact on Zambian life in general over the years. But sometimes it worked, um, <laughs> sort of seeing the parallels between COVID-19 and, for example, there is no vaccine, um, no real treatment or clear treatment, there's no cure. Um, and that you get tested for it. And, but sometimes it didn't make sense. And that, that got very confusing, even for relatively well-informed, well-educated community people. So, you know, how come you could test positive, then you could test negative, whereas with HIV, if you're positive, you're positive for life and so on. They also had, couldn't see COVID. They had very little evidence of it. So one traditional healer said, you know, we, we have no word for this in our language. And another woman said, you know, we have words for the symptoms, but we don't have a word for COVID. And they, they, there was very little um, evidence of it. They, yeah, there was only a couple of people that, this is late August, where, who actually had had COVID or knew somebody who had COVID. So extremely, extremely li limited evidence, very invisible in this community. And that of course sort of fed a lot of conspiracy theories about COVID. Um, just to, so the, the first point is the point that we've never seen anyone who had the virus. Um, the, the man who's sort of doing a community engagement meeting shared his experience of having COVID, that was 
the only testimony that we had, not only through BBS, which was only five days, but through the whole sort of stretch of engagement um, with the community. Um, there was also very, um, there was this feeling that, that it was the kind of more privileged groups that were more vulnerable to get COVID. Um, so here we are poor, we move around freely, we don't get sick. And despite having to kind of mix a lot. Um, and then the most dominant uh, conspiracy was that the government um, was using COVID to make money for their campaign. So that this was a way to fund the elections next year or to, yeah. Um, in terms of response to COVID, um, so when it, when, you know, when it first, people first became aware of it in March and um, public health measures were first introduced, um, people said that initially they adhered to it, but over time, this sort of fell away. Um, and this was very evident, um, particularly in the sort of gathering spaces in the community. Um, there were a lot of fears about testing for COVID and um, there was fears about the pain of being tested for COVID. There was fears about what would happen if you were positive, not only about stigma, but others sort of knowing you had it and treating you differently, but also about just the practicalities of being told to self-isolate or not being visited in hospital or quarantine. Um, and yeah, I thought that was that was interesting that that um, I'll talk a little bit later actually about the health facility um, rather than now. And there was also some concerns that our study, so our study is going to all households in the community and screening them for COVID symptoms. And if they are symptomatic, asking them to go forward to a clinical test to be tested for COVID um, using a rapid test that gives you results in 20 to 40 minutes. Um, and they were concerned that these people that were going door to door would be spreading COVID themselves. On a more sort of positive note, there were indications of kind of resilience um, and helping social cohesion. Um, definitely the provision of free waters provide, provided people with opportunities for gardens and other activities. Um, some of the women commented it was good to have men and young people at home more because they could see the problems in the household. Um, and yeah, some evidence of community members helping each other. Um, but whilst we were doing BBS, there were two funerals and we did some observations at the funeral houses. Um, and funerals are challenging. So this, the first quote is sort of showing how people, they call it chin or chinning or mouthing that you don't wear the mask correctly. Um, also that although people might be avoiding the actual funeral home and not sleeping there or spending as much time there in graveyards people still come in great numbers and partly that's to do with being fed as well on the burial day um, and then the last quote just illustrates which I what I talked about before the sort of fear of being isolated and how contrary that is to what normally happens when you're sick when people visit you so finally, just looking at the impact of COVID. Um, so they definitely, as Ellen found out, or they reported, um, it had a big impact on people's lives. I mean, much bigger than actually the visibility of the disease itself. So it meant that people were mingling less and, and moving around less. Um, it really had a massive economic impact. This is a community where there is, um, civil servants and um, historically a sort of lower middle class population and they were more buffered um, but they also had a lot of demands on them. The health system, um, both the health workers and the numbers at the health facilities and what we heard was that there are far fewer people attending local health facilities and, and the fear is not that you might get infected with COVID at, at the health facility. The fear is much more not wanting to get tested and diagnosed and found to be positive. Um, and that meant that people did a lot of self-medication. I was really surprised by Ellen, by your 65% saying they go to health facilities because that's not 
what we heard or what experience what we're experiencing with people who are symptomatic. Um, they know they should, but they don't, they don't want to. So there's a lot of sort of managing it yourself. Um, health workers felt they didn't have enough protection or good enough quality. Um, they reported a lot more brought in dead and a lot of those brought in dead being tested positive. Um, definitely a lot more awareness of, of hypertension and diabetes. And there are two health facilities because it's two communities and the, the, the measures kind of differed a bit within health facilities. So in some wards, they were practicing more measures than others. Um, and I think there was a lot of bad feeling about the schools closing and, and a lot of sort of saying that this would cause young people to get into trouble, to get pregnant, a lot of challenges with online and TV schooling and sort of concerned about how people, how our children would catch up. So, um, so these quotes just illustrate um, the impact of COVID on people's lives and on their businesses um, and people's fears about the test and the, the sort of allegations that closing schools would lead to more pregnancies. I'm not going to I'm not going to go through this in any detail, but just to say that we produced a report for the BBS that we shared. Um, we discussed with the CCT team, we discussed with the study, study team, we discussed with the district, and we've discussed with different community groups. We're very happy to share this with you. Um, and what we did in the report was think about, you know, what are the measures, what's the knowledge of these, and what is practiced? Because I know somebody's interested in churches. One thing was that there was very little awareness that, that even though churches the denominations varied to what they practice, but there was no, absolutely no measures around singing and very big resistance to changing anything around singing. So no masking up, sharing microphones, the choir sat very closely together. So very low awareness about the risk of transmission through singing, which was interesting. So I'm, I'm not gonna sit on this. Just to say that we, um, when we did look to the hotspots, we had asked the Neighbourhood Health Committee to rank the hotspots. And so higher numbers are more risky for HIV, lower is less risky. And we also used a TB transmission scorecard to assess the space ourselves for COVID. And uh, it's interesting that churches were ranked very low by the community, the NHC, but much higher by the TB transmission scorecard. And sometimes, you know, community ranking and uh, the TB transmission ranking was more equivalent, like at funerals or bars, um, shippings. So this is a map of the community and the uh, the two communities in Cabway, and the sort of the the green line sort of line is where we did the walk, the BBS walk, and there are actually the places that we observed um, that were considered hot spots are uh, also indicated. So finally, just to finish on reflections on COVID stigma, um, stigma is an area that I've done a lot of research on um, in relation to TB, uh, disability, HIV. And I'm also really believe in kind of health related stigma and sort of working across conditions. And what, what we see with COVID is that the same sort of processes come into play. Um, and I just sort of, when we did the training for the staff, because we're administering some stigma indicators on COVID and HIV and mental health and TB, um, we asked the staff, the, the study team to kind of reflect on what do people say about um, healthcare workers living with HIV or TB patients and COVID patients. So. And, and with COVID patients, they say there are people, they said many things, but this is one example, bringing diseases with other countries. So you can see how, yet again, stigma sort of sticks to social fault lines. And in, in COVID's case, it's about sort of another example of inequity. Um, just to say, because in case everyone, anyone's interested, that I'm sort of part of a group of stigma researchers that, that developed some COVID indicators. Very, very happy to, to share them. We have shared them quite widely. We are using them in the study in Cabway. We also use them in an SMS survey in Zambia and Ghana, which um, we're just 
waiting results at the moment, um, we had 1,355 um, people respond in Zambia, across Zambia. Um, and just to sort of, sorry, it's a very crowded slide, but the sort of, because it was an SMS survey, we had to kind of limit our characters and our number and how many items, but the items, you know, look at whether COVID is related, is sort of linked to dirt, to irresponsible behavior, whether foreigners are blamed, uh, looking at links to shame and, um, and sort of perceptions of risk and avoidance. Um, and whether people will avoid healthcare workers who care for people with COVID. Um, so we're just analyzing that at the moment. Um, just finally to say that the study is uh, funded by the EU through EDCTP and to acknowledge all our partners um, who are part of the research. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Ginny. It was a very, very, very interesting uh, presentation, very rich. Um, thanks both Musonda and Ginny for sharing this. Uh, I think that's part of the discussion is also like, you know, how can we cross fertilize some of our studies because there's so many overlaps. And, uh, but we might not always be aware of uh, one another's studies. Um, but I have one... Um, Coming back, coming back to the religion one. So this is uh, for Jeannie. Thanks for an interesting presentation, Jeannie. In my research on sermons held in the Reformed Church in Zambia during the lockdown of churches, I noticed that several pastors were worried about the influence of social distancing measures on the social fabric in Zambia. They said that this would lead Zambians to becoming more individualistic and lose their communitarian values. Uh, have you come across these fears as well? This is both to Musonda and uh, and Jimmy, really. Musonda, do you do you want to answer that? Because you've had a lot of interaction with churches through community engagement, whereas we just did the observations um, doing BBS. Well, um, I've not come or we did not come uh, across that particular view. Uh, but, but, but I think that you could see maybe from the uh, actions of uh, the pastors or the priests themselves that they were sometimes no less likely actually to adhere to the public health measures by, you know, wearing a mask when preaching and, and all that. So possibly that also points, you know, to, to the fact that they wanted to be, you know, accepted you know by their congregation you know when when they are preaching i remember talking to one priest you know who actually said look uh, there are some people who are really more religious than others and and, and they feel that some of these covid you know uh, measures make them less religious so yeah so that's the closest i go to that yeah. And just one funny story, actually, when we were doing our observations, one of the pastors, um, I think it was in a more Pentecostal church, was actually an, anyway, we knew him. He, he used to be a clinical officer, was a clinical officer. And um, everyone was falling asleep. It was very, very long service. So much, some churches were much better about restricting the time of, of the service. Some just let the services go on. And... Uh, and he said to everybody that they looked like they were falling asleep and they also looked like they were all dead in a coffin because of their masks mm -hmm. and that they should take their masks off and maybe wake them up. <laughs> so it's kind of semi-funny, but, you know, not appropriate. So, yeah, I mean, there was quite a... All the churches tried to do something, but some of them were much stricter about various measures than others. And yeah. But all of them, the choirs the choirs sort of squashed together and sang loudly. <laughs> yeah, and that was very and, good. And the initial observation, Jean, was that, you know, the, the, the more traditional churches, you know, like the Catholics and others who could establish buildings and benches had difficulties, you know, adhering you know, to social distances because they were this bench. But for the, um, the, the, the more Pentecostal small churches, it was much easier for social distancing because then they have just one, you know, individual chairs and people can sit on individual chairs. But however, the opposite was the case when it came to actually, you know, uh, 
preaching, the manner of preaching, and also limiting services. So again, the opposite of what was the case. But, but I think that also we should give credit to the churches because actually, you know, uh, if you're a strong believer, you believe in God helping you in all situations. You know, uh, the fact that, you know, a, a lot of churches, most of them really tried to adhere to these measures, I think is, is something that we should actually <laughs> give credit to them. Yeah, yeah thanks very much. Uh, it's not a question uh, for both presenters, thank you. Uh, can you please highlight if there were any findings or analysis about different impacts or different stigmas within subgroups of the community, such as when women, men, uh, or children, adolescents versus elders, or people with disabilities or pregnant. We find that this type of evidence is very much needed. I don't know if Ellen, want, you want to answer. So we, we don't we don't know that yet. And I mean, in a rapid qualitative assessment like BBS, you, it's very hard to 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 tell. Um, we are administering the stigma indicators to quite a few people, not only people symptomatic, but also people coming forward for TV screening. So about four thousand adults. So we will end up being able to look at those kind of issues and we do have a particular interest in disability in people with disability because of a disability PhD student um, who's focusing on that. Um, I, I think I, all I would say about that is I think that stigma, maybe what's a bit un, more unusual with COVID is for health workers. Not so unusual because for health workers living with HIV or having TB, they also face a lot of stigma because they should know better than getting it. And I, but I think with COVID, it's a bit different because um, the one thing that I, I've only looked at the kind of initial frequencies from our SMS survey, but definitely health workers are, you know, the majority of people are avoiding health workers because of them having contact with COVID patients. So I think that's something that's a bit more specific um so but really good question and i agree very important area ellen I did no we also haven't don't have any information in terms of which groups are more likely either to sort of um be perceived as having you know perceived stigmatically in a sense or or be likely to actually have stigmas or hold them against others right so i think those are two two sides of the question. And, and can I slip in a question for, for Ginny and Masanda at this point? Maria, is that okay? Yeah, it's welcome, yeah. Um, because it's, it's, it's along these same lines. I mean, I am curious in terms of you, in the, in the indicators that you outlined, Jenny, you, you said that, you know, do you think foreigners are more likely to have this is, um, is, is one of the ways in which we've been thinking about this, right? Or foreigners are kind of outsiders. In other words, do you see them as more likely to be carriers of the disease? And, and you know, probably is better, better than I do that in anthropology, there's some discussion of that, those relationships is going together. Um, so to me, it's, a, it, it's an interesting question if, if you're seeing any of that. I mean, I know it's too early for the, for the survey part, but in terms of the, the qualitative evidence, were you seeing any of that or, or is this community one in which you don't necessarily have those sets of divisions that can be easily discussed? Yeah, I mean, definitely people felt that um, white people were more likely to get COVID and that wealthier people were more likely to get COVID um, and were cautious about people coming from the Conde or, you know, definitely travel. People had really limited their travel and switch livelihoods to avoid travel. So, or even sometimes travel to the town center. So there was one lady that sells samosas in the town center and she started, yeah, no, but definitely she started doing something else in the community to cut down on her exposure. But um, that, I mean, that was a quite a sort of common narrative about COVID was that it, that it came with wealth um, with people who had, my yards and who traveled outside the country. Um, yeah, definitely, and truck drivers and th those sort of link associations. Which is actually interesting because yeah. it's not necessarily so wrong in terms of the traveling part of it, right? So that's, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah, and so I think it, was a, it is actually a hoax, you know, uh, from the white uh, people to try and uh, kill the, the black race. Um, in, in fact, some people thought that uh, even the COVID tests themselves, you know, are, are, especially the swabs, actually, they, they are laced, you know, with, a, you know, uh, with some reagents actually to to, to kill the, 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 the black race. And, and, and that's why I think of, of late when we were piloting the, 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 the COVID study, you know, some of the people were asking if there are other ways of collecting, you know, Samples other than you know the the, the the swap, you know, but there was also this fear that uh, you know the 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 stick reaches as far as the brain, you know, uh, and there were all these rumors we got from the beginning from the community, you know, that there were individuals that bled to death and all that, but but all these were, these were just uh, rumors, but but this actually helped us, you know, to craft messages, you know, to to respond to the community. And in terms of vaccines, a lot of concern about vaccines and about people being used as guinea pigs. You know, why, why would you make a vaccine in America and then test it in Africa? Why would you do that unless it was a risk? And, you know, so, yeah, the same sort of fears and concerns about that. Mm -hmm. Another question. And I think Kate Proust would have probably asked this question. She's in the audience. Is the social cash transfer because there's been this only intervention on emergency cash? Uh, Musonda, did you see any evidence of, of kind of the interventions from outside in terms of government or donors uh, handing out the emergency cash uh, or equivalent of that? Well, I, and I think you can, Gina can speak to this more clearly. Yes, there were one or two um, situations where um, uh, people were giving were being given out uh, cash, but no one knew clearly what this this was. I, I think because during this period there have been no COVID funds, you no know, for for to uh, to really you know mitigate you know the the, the harsh uh, situations uh, that have. Uh, a reason, but also um, because the social cash transfer also, uh, to some extent, you know, expanded the individuals actually, you know, that had to benefit. So there was a bit of social cash transfer, but there was, but also a, a mix of you know other uh, uh, interventions arising, you know, from the uh, the COVID situation. Yeah, so, so we did some research um, on poverty in the same community um, at the beginning of the year, so before COVID. So we knew from that that anybody who was supposed to be a beneficiary of social cash transfer in this particular community hadn't be, had received funds for over a year. So whilst we were in the field, actually not for BBS, during Sondra, I think one of our July community meetings, um, and then again in BBS, it came up that they were re-registering beneficiaries for social cash transfer, but this was being done by the ruling party. So I'm not, so there was concerns about who would get on the list. They also, in one of the, when we shared the BBS findings with the CCT, there had been some distribution of um, food, but they just, it, they just ended up giving it to anyone, it just got very chaotic and it didn't reach who it was supposed to reach. So, no, I mean, in I was trying to think of any other initiatives, um, maybe a few sort of local initiatives with masks and churches, but nothing sort of comprehensive or systematic. And definitely by early September, there wasn't anybody getting social cash transfer. Mm -hmm. Can I ask another question uh, to follow yeah. up? And to Ginny, when you're talking about the mask initiatives or others, who's who's initiating those? Do you have a sense? Yeah, some churches and NGOs in quite sort of low key. I mean, we also, as a study, initiated it. So we we used to give masks to anybody and we are still giving masks to anyone that screened or comes to the TB screening. So either screen for COVID or TB screening, but we ordered quite a lot of those masks to be made in the community. But the tailors 
that's where we learned about it was from the tailors. They said they'd particularly at the beginning got a couple of big orders um, for masks and they made them very well, actually. Um, yeah, I'd, Ellen, I wanted to ask you um, a question as well about, I don't know, Maya will let me know when I can. Yeah, yeah, you go ahead now. Yeah, it's open uh, for everyone. Two questions about sort of phone methods, I guess. So when I looked at your findings, which were really interesting, I felt like some of, how do you deal with bias, like with people telling you what they know they should be doing? So it seemed to me that your, your questions about fear, for example, worked better than your questions about measures because people know that they, so for example, when we did this phone survey, not in this community, but nationally, everyone said that they would get a test and go to the health facility, but our observations are not saying that at all <laughs> in this community. So, yeah, so I just wondered how, how I just feel like some of the questions maybe work better as through the phone than others. And then the second question was, I thought it was really interesting how you split your themes out, up and produce reports on each theme. And I wondered why you did that and whether that was effective. So the latter question, I'm not sure if it's effective in terms of, I mean, people who are who are getting them, I guess, can, can tell more. Um, I think it was a way that it was uh, somewhat easier for us to kind of chunk it out in, in that sense, right? And we wanted to not to be, um, we didn't want to sort of be writing a long report and have it, things get kind of lost in, you know, lost in it. Now, I mean, the flip side, of course, is then you lose some of the context, you lose some of the depth. It's frankly some of the same uh, kind of trade-offs that we have between your approach, which I'm actually very, I, I love it. I'm sort of very envious of in a sense, right? Kind of a very deep approach within a community and then a kind of broader approach. I mean, I think there's some, um, some ways in which those trade-offs are similar. Um, in terms of the, the bias, I mean, you're absolutely right. So, one way to read what a couple of ways we're trying to address bias. So um, when we're looking at something like, you know, would you get tested? The reason for asking, do you think others would get tested is actually because I might be more likely to tell you the truth about how much I, I want to get tested if I tell you about somebody else than if I tell you about me, right? So, you know, one reading of that is that really people are much less likely to get tested than what they say because their, their imputing of other people's re responses is much closer to their own, their own reaction than their own sort of position that's stated, right? Um, you're right, we also might have an, uh, sort of an inflated notion of who's avoiding gatherings or who's staying at home, et cetera. What does seem to make sense though is that kind of more costly actions, if you will, like things like staying away from friends or family or gatherings or, or staying at home, are things that are not, you know, certainly not everybody's saying they're doing them, right? Even if they might think that there's a bias. So, so in that sense, you know, what might be happening if there's social desirability bias that's coming in is that, you know, everything is a bit inflated. That's very, very possible. But I think still there's good reasons to think that the, that it's not that only the people who are educated inflate or only the people in some. So when we're looking at differences across the country, I think it still tells us something. Um, and then there's a third way that we try to deal with it, which is was the part about the stereotypes, for instance. So um, when we were talking to our partner in Malawi, so we first did the survey in Malawi and then we did it in, in Zambia, um, you know, he said he was really interested in knowing, I said, do, do we think that, you know, people who are Chinese or Chinese, because there's quite a big Chinese community, right, are going to be seen as more likely to have COVID. And he said, no, but he thought that the people who were of Indian descent, when is, would be more likely to be seen as having COVID because they had been the first cases recorded. And then we could, you know, people started thinking a little like the truck drivers and, you know, the people who travel that, you know, those are the people who are getting COVID. So it's less about what they're doing and more about their blood type or who they are. So, so, 
now the problem with simply saying if you know do you think that these people have covid or you know are you less likely to help this person than this person is we we would expect social desire like people to say what they think we want to hear right they would say that there was no difference or say that they would help everybody equally so in that case the, the survey experiment method allows us to just give a story um, and say, okay, you know, you had somebody who was Mwenye, who's, you know, lives next door to you, has a hurt leg, will you help them to the hospital? And we can sort of give that story, but, but change, is it Mwenye or Malawian or Zambian, and see if it made a difference, what type of person, without asking them directly, right? So, so that's one way we're trying to, to get at that, that issue, because I think it's a problem. I think it's a, it's a, it's a tricky a tricky thing when what you want to know, you also know people might not think is what you want to hear. Yeah. Yeah. In, in addition to that, Helen, I was wondering whether you are going to do this survey again and uh, how often you planned it because it really COVID-19 seems to be really like a moving target. Things seem to be changing so rapidly, you know, and whether it's adherence, you know, to, to, to public health measures, you know, whether it's really just, you know, uh, people's views and all that, they keep on changing. And it would be interesting really to capture this change and, and at particular points in time. So for example, you did mention the fact that the, you know, uh, that the restrictions were really, you know, uh, mostly re re reinforced. I don't know really in which places, but also would this situation still apply now? I lost you, Mosanda. Is that right? I can, I can, I'm, I'm still being heard. Am I still being heard? Yeah. Yes, you were. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, his point was just about that. I mean, even the difference between when you did your survey and when we did our field work, you could, things were beginning to relax a lot more. So things change very fast. They do change very fast. I mean, we're we're going into the field again, probably next week or late next week, early the following. So we we have a second survey planned in in Zambia. Um, we've just finished one in in Kenya. Those are different countries, obviously, in very different contexts. But you know, but the point of and that was the for for the we were working with Tifa there, and that was the fourth survey that they that they were doing there. Um, I think that that it's. Absolutely correct that they change over time and, and there's a lot we can learn about those changes and how people get tired of restrictions or when they're when they're willing to put them in place, etc. And so um, our hope is that we would be able to continue doing it past this last survey. Um, and then, then, of course, we all have to talk to our donors about that, right? Because there's, you know, the, the problem that we run into is just a sort of a limited resources problem. Um, but I do think that you're absolutely right. There's lots of reasons to think that um, we've got a snapshot and even on things like the stigma and stereotypes issues, we can very much imagine that those change as people become more knowledgeable as, you know, people who are sort of, you know, unfortunately kind of more local and haven't traveled are, you know, also get it that we can sort of, you know, people's expectations and beliefs and behaviors change over time. Um, and this is a very moving target. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, all of you. I think um, I think it's really interesting to observe generally that there's a shift in research methodology. I think all of you are doing the telephone survey and doing... Um, of course, Ginny and Musonde have been in the field always like this. It's just changed its character a little bit. Uh, but of course, what we've also noticed that, you know, there's less foreign researchers who are able to come out. Um, so there's been quite a shift of... of doing uh, research from from within the country. Uh, so I'm just curious, you know, how the research field will play out uh, and if it will have a lasting impact in itself. Uh, I think Musonda and Ginny were already hinting to that, that, you know, it will have impact on future research and how do you deal with communities. Um, since we have only a few minutes left, I thought we can have a small, uh, just a few sentences about the next steps in both your projects, what you're going to do. Uh, so that, you know, people who are following this discussion can follow up, you know, where are you going to, what's you going to be your outlet for your next uh, findings? Where can they find more information? What are you going to, to do next? So maybe Musonda, you can start. Yeah. Um, 
so I think go, go, going forward, what we want to do is to write a couple of manuscripts. Um, one particular on community engagement, um, you know, um, um, reflecting on you know, uh, how to begin community engagement, you know, in an epidemic. I, I think that is, um, that would be a, a first lesson for Zambia in a way. Um, when we were writing up this uh, uh, protocol, we had to rely more really, you know, on um, resources from West Africa and neighboring Congo looking at, you know, experiences with Ebola. Yeah, but as we started developing the, the community uh, emergency preparedness plan, we realized actually that we can dig locally and look at, you know, the uh, resources we have locally. So for example, we know people have experienced cholera, people have experienced typhoid, and, 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 and poverty, and, and we were drawing you know, on the experiences, how they responded to that, the resilience that was there, the resources you now that we are used to inform the community in you know, our preparedness plan. So that's another thing really, we want to develop that plan together with the community, together with the districts. And uh, we're hoping really that's, that that would be a bottom-up approach, because actually what is happening is that uh, a, uh, the, the actual impact is right in the communities, right down there. But the responses are mooted up there, you know, at the district, at, MO, at, MO, at uh, MOH level. And, and we want to really have this middle ground, you know, where the community, you know, can, can be the one to start re responding, you know, and, and, and using their resources. But at the same time, knowing that, you know, they can reach out you know, to the district to, to the OMH through these structures that are already uh, in, in place and working together. Though. So that's something that uh, we, we will we'll be looking at. Jenny? Yeah, I mean, just really quickly. So we will sort of have a particular interest in the impact of COVID on people with disability and on mental health. And that will be led by two Zambian PhD students. Um, I have a particular interest in stigma as ever. And we also have uh, sort of interest in COVID um, e sort of economic impact as well, which will follow through. So we're, con we're continuing to do collect data. We have a social scientist based full time in Cabway, uh, who Masandra and I uh, supervise and support. So, yeah. And Ellen, maybe you can have the last word on that. Yeah, thank you. No, and, and again, thank you everybody for um, for a really interesting presentations and discussion. Uh, in, in our case, we're, like I said, fielding the, the second survey in the beginning of the month. And um, a lot of that is a, really aimed at understanding what types of communities have been able to sort of uh, develop community responses and who does and sort of resilience questions. And so we're coupling what we're doing with the data that we collected in 2019, um, which was also a reason why we ended up being able to, to do these surveys with the telephone. So we collected um, basically data across the, the, the border region in Lusaka in 2019, as well as in Malawi and in Canada. Kenya, um, and done it in a way that was heavily clustered so we could understand a lot more about the communities themselves. So now it's a, to sort of try to understand how these responses um, fit in with the pre-COVID um, community sort of um, structures and authority systems that were in place. So that's, that's the next step, at least the most immediate next step for us. Okay. Thanks. And then hopefully, yeah, some publications probably along the line. Yes, um, including things you get roped into. But. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll, we'll keep you informed about uh, all those new developments and give, you know, everything will be open access so people can actually have uh, used the information. I think it's useful to keep each other abreast of uh, the research that we're doing because it's really cross fertilizers really well. Uh, and with that, I want to thank everybody for participating. Uh, people from Zambar to make Time, I know you're very, very busy, both Jenny and Musonda, and uh, of course, Ellen for facilitating and uh, her team as well. And uh, hopefully, to, uh, we'll meet at the next uh, webinar, or hopefully, in future, we'll meet each other in person. person. <laughs> <laughs> that would be really good. All right. Thanks, Thanks. very much. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye.